thanks to a viewer, I have the SBS 3000 micro subwoofer, this speaker right here. Here's a quick video and I'll run down some specs. Retail is $899. This features two 8-inch woofers in dual opposed configuration. Built-in Class D amplifier with 800 watts of continuous power. And while the speaker doesn't have a lot of switches and things like that on it, you can access a lot of different features via the app. So it has three bands of parametric EQ, great feature to have. You can control volume, you can control the filter, and you can control some other settings in it, such as delay. That is the one thing that I really like about SBS subwoofers is the app, because you don't have to get up and walk back and forth between your seated position to dial in the sound. You can just sit right in your seat, close your eyes, and move the slider, change a few things. And I really like the fact that they incorporate three bands of parametric EQ. So if you want to go in and fix a couple room mode issues where it's too resonant, or too boomy, you can do that very, very easily. And just give you a, an idea of size. I'm going to do this. I'll pick it up. And, and this one actually is a little bit lighter than the KEF KC62 I showed you before. But you can just check out the back of it. And here it is. Got some grills over the subwoofers. And then here is a picture comparing this subwoofer to the KEF KC62, just for size reference. In terms of sound, you guys know me. When it comes to subwoofers, it's basically just about the output capability because where you place the sub matters almost as much, arguably more than the pure response of the subwoofer itself. So when I say that, what I mean to say is I could tell you that it sounded pleasant or chesty or boomy or chocolatey bottom end, but so much of those factors are determined by my room, by the settings that I've used, that it really, in my honest professional opinion, I don't know why we waste time talking about the sound of subwoofers when it's so room dependent. You may put the subwoofer in your room and have a totally different experience because where I have a dip in response, you have a major peak. Those things matter. So that's why I like to really just stick to data for subwoofer discussions. So let's do that. Let's look at first the frequency response of the SVS 3000 micro. And that's what we see here on the screen. Now I've tested this subwoofer at three different output levels, feeding three different input signals. The initial input signal is 0.01 volts the second is 0.1 volt, and the third is 2 volt, which corresponds basically with the maximum output capability of the subwoofer. And we see those respectively in the black, the red, and then the blue lines. And what we can see and what I really want you to pay attention to is the overall shape of the response. At 0.01 volt input, you're roughly around 65 decibels in output, and we have this weird dip around 65 hertz. I don't understand why that's there. This was measured the exact same day as about six other subwoofers. None of the other subwoofers exhibited this dip. So it does seem that it is really inherent in the subwoofer itself. That's odd. If you increase the output to around 86, 87 decibels at one meter anechoic, so full space, not ground plane, then you still have this dip, but it's filled in a little bit more and you get pretty decent extension. It's not super low, but for dual eights, uh, it's it's pretty good. We're going to talk more about the extension when we talk about the maximum output capability. So when I feed this speaker the maximum input voltage that it can take, which is roughly around two volts, and actually it's, it's a little bit less, this gives me an idea in the blue of what the response is doing, how much compression and limiting, and what the maximum SPL capability of this subwoofer is. So the maximum SPL capability at one meter full anechoic free space, not ground plane, again. Uh, on the upper end of the mid base region, we'll say above 70 hertz, you're looking at around 95 decibels or so, going up to about two, 300 hertz. However, you see this dip through here and then it falls off more and more. There's a lot of compression in this subwoofer and that's to limit the excursion of the woofer so you don't have mechanical noise and you don't burn up the voice coils, essentially. How good is that output. Let me just go ahead and compare it to something that we've discussed recently. That is the KEF KC62. And here we go. At the 
medium output of about 86, 87 decibels SPL. The SVS is in red, same response that we saw earlier because this is literally the same graph. I just copied and pasted it over. And then the KEF KC62 is in blue. The KEF is more linear in response. It doesn't have this dip, but it does roll off a little bit sooner. And you've got about five decibels or so difference, primarily around 40 to 30 hertz, you know, just kind of looking in this window right there. So it's about five decibels more output for the SVS at this voltage input. But what happens when I crank up the input voltage and max out the SPL of both of these subwoofers? Well, SVS Micro actually doesn't do as well as the KEF. The KEF KC62 has a little bit more SPL on the lower end or through the mid band and even into the lowest end around 10 hertz. If you go up in frequency, you can see that the KEF KC62 also has more output capability. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that the CEA numbers are going to be better for the KEF, but just in terms of the actual frequency response where harmonic distortion is not a factor, this is the output levels that we can expect between the SVS and the KEF if you're interested in what the kind of comparison there is. I mentioned the CEA, so let's look at the CEA 2010 results and here we go. At 20 hertz, you have about 76 decibels, 25 is about 81, and then about 86, and then going on up through that. Let's do a comparison against the KEF KC62 now. This is a sheet that I've created. I'll put the link in the description below, and it just shows the numbers of the CEA 2010A results for the SVS and for the KEF, but let's look at it in a graphical scale. And here we are. So on the low end, the SVS registers at about 76 decibels at 20 hertz. KEF is about 80 decibels. So there's about four to five decibels difference between 20 hertz to roughly 25 hertz. And then at 31 hertz, you start to close the gap. And then around 40 hertz is where the SVS starts to pick up some steam and gets a little bit more output. And then we're around 80, 63 hertz. You can see, well, let's just pull up a number here. 106 on the SVS at 63, 97. So there's about eight decibels or so between the KEF and the SVS at 63 Hertz. What does that mean? Well, that just means in terms of a standard, the ZEA 2010A standard, the SVS performs better than the KEF KC62 above about 40 Hertz, but the KC62 does better than the SVS below about 40 Hertz. And then if we go back to the maximum output Remember I said the SVS was lower than the KEF. Well, that's because the CEA 2010 is factoring in distortion. So what that means is, according to the CEA 2010A results, the KEF has higher distortion above about 40 Hertz than the SVS does. But below that, the KEF has lower distortion than the SVS. Now, how much of that's gonna be audible Honestly, I don't know, okay? I mean, that's that's the honest to goodness truth. I don't think that CEA 2010A is the end all be all. And I personally put more weight into the frequency response, but also the linearity of the CEA results. And in this case, you know, I'm honestly kind of leaning more towards the KEF, KC62. However, the KEF is about $1,500 where the SVS is about $900. So there's a pretty big price difference between those two. The KEF is a little bit smaller, but it's not astronomically smaller. And I would almost say that if you thought you could spring and get two SVSs, then maybe that's what you should do. And then use the EQ to kind of clean up and make it a little bit more linear. Because again, with the, with the SVS, you get equalization. Having said that, the KEF sure does look pretty dang cool. And I will leave that choice up to you, but hopefully now that you've got some of this data, you can say, all right, well, I feel confident that this is the right one for me, or maybe this one just doesn't make sense financially for me. With all of that said, I am going to end this review. I've got more eight inch, six and a half inch subwoofer reviews coming. We're going to start building this database, do more comparisons, but I will tell you that right now, I think these are probably the two leaders of the pack. Stay tuned. We're going to have more coming. I will talk to you all later. If you're interested in buying any of the stuff that I'm talking about, please consider using one of my affiliate links that I will put in the description below. You got the data so you can make your own mind up as to what makes sense for you. But when you go through those links, that does give me a small commission at no additional cost to you. And I honestly really appreciate it. This stuff isn't free. It costs me a lot of money to box this stuff back up. 
I usually make anywhere from about $35 to $50 per video, 50 if I'm lucky. And there's not a lot of room left on the table for me after that. So please consider using one of the affiliate links or you can join me at patreon.com slash Aaron's Audio Corner. I will talk to you all later. Take care. Peace.